Hello. Today I'm going to give you a quick overview of my copy of a board game called Hour of Glory. Hour of Glory itself is perched in an odd position in the board gaming marketplace because the game is available for you to buy and download as a PDF, but it is also available as a fully made full production version. If, like me, you've bought and created the PDF version, you can then go on to go and buy the metal miniatures from Warmaker. What I'm going to do in this video is show you basically what I did with my copy of the Hour of Glory Stronghold Kit. I've brought the PDF version and then made up the components, and I'm going to show you each of the components and tell you how I went about making them. If you make a lot of print and play games, much like myself, then you'll find yourself having trouble trying to find places to put the games. As you can see here, I've repurposed an old backgammon box, and this is where my Hour of Glory set sits. As you can see, the box itself is stuffed to the gunnels with bits and pieces that I've printed out for this game. All of these come in the basic PDF. Let's take a look at the parts. This rather uninspiring board segment is the entrance. This is where your figures are going to be starting the fight. As you can see, I mounted it on rather thick card. It's about three or four millimeters thick, and it's very tough. I actually printed all the board segments onto very thin card, then laid them on top of the thick card, drew round them, and that gave me the template that I cut out. Then it was simply a case of laying one on top of the other, and then using clear sticky tape to run round all the edges. And that gave me a very solid piece of card that's nice heavy weight so it doesn't slip around on the tabletop too much. This next room is much more appealing. We've got some colour there. As you can see, it's easier to make out the sticky tape that's running round the edge of this board. Also notice this room has two entranceways, one on each side, and a piece of corridor as well. Let's look at the next one. Once again, the sticky tape is more obvious around the edges, and again, you can see that there's a different coloured room here. There are in fact nine different rooms, and they all have their own different floor pattern, and I've mounted them all in the same way. This next item is not actually a board that you play on. It's a track that you keep by the side of the board, and as the alert status in the camp goes up, then you put markers on here. This is double-sided, and as you can see, I've mounted it onto a much thinner card. This card is roughly, I suppose, two thicknesses of a cereal packet type card. This didn't have to be as hard wearing as the main boards because it only has counters dropped on top of it. It gets flipped over occasionally as well. Once again, it's printed and then stuck onto cardboard using sticky tape running around the edges. This has another advantage as well as holding the printed paper or card on top of its backing. It also protects it from handling because when you pick these things up, you pick them up by the edge. So all your finger grease goes onto that clear tape rather than onto the component and staining it. And here's the reverse of that track. On one side, you're building up the alert status until finally the alarm goes off and then you flip it over and they put the instructions for what you do during an alarm on the back. It makes it a very useful component. Next up, we have the character cards. Now, when you're playing an assault on the bunker, you take one of these characters. These are double-sided. On one side, it shows the character in action. On the other side, it shows the character in a more sneaky mode. Therefore, they're double-sided, and you're going to be flipping them from one side to the other all through the game. So what I decided to do was actually go as far as laminating them. You can just about make out the plastic lamination around the edges of these cards. Through trial and error, I found out that when it comes to laminating an item, you basically want to print it on paper. If you move up to cardboard, then you tend to find that the lamination process doesn't work as well because it pushes the heated rollers apart and basically the glue just doesn't set properly. In this next image, you can see some of the stand-up minis. These are simply printed onto cardboard, folded in half because they're double-sided, and then stuck into the base. Here you can see the two types of German guards that are at the bunker. On the left, we have two of the standing sentinels who stand and guard each of the doorways. On the right, you can see the different guards that come out and chase after you. Here we have the alert tokens, and these are all double-sided. As you can see, there's a simple alert marker on one side and a corpse printed on the other side. Now, as the game progresses, these are used to build up the tension towards the alarm actually going off. And because of that, I made them a very heavyweight component. It makes them feel important when you're playing. And that's something you need to bear in mind when you're making a game. How important is it and how much wear is it going to get? I printed the two sides here to separate sheets of thin card. 
I then stuck one sheet onto the thick basing material, and in this case, because the counters I didn't want to run tape round each of them, I actually used a spray-on glue. I then cut out those as one solid block rather than individual counters, because that makes it easier to stick the back on. Now, the back was made up of the opposite side of the counters, and again, I left that as a solid block, so of course, once I'd cut out the front, that gave me an exact match for lining up the second side. Here we have the secret cards, and in the game you're going to be moving around the board trying to pick these up. Now, you can possibly see from the top there that some of the cards are slightly warped, and that's down to how I produce them. I printed them to thin card, cut them out, folded them over because they're double-sided, and then I used a glue stick to hold these together. The problem with this technique for cards is that the glue stick itself is quite wet, and in order to get enough glue onto the card, you have to really cover it and that led to the warping you see here. If I was going to make these cards again, I would have printed them onto very thin card or paper, and then laminated them. Here we have the doors. Every doorway in the game has a door standing up there. As you can see, they've got rather strange mountings at the bottom. In front of these doors, I put a plastic base, the sort of thing that's used for cardboard stand-ups normally. You can see from the doors that they're actually very thin, and this is because I printed them to cheap, thin card. Unfortunately, because the card was so thin, it just pulled out of these plastic bases, so I had to find some other alternate mounting technique for doors. The things these doors are actually standing in are metal bulldog clips. They're very small, and they came in a packet, and there was about 150 in there for less than a pound. What I've done is I've sprung them open, slipped the cardboard in there, and then removed the handles. And the handles come out just by squeezing them and pulling them away. Because they're metal, they're quite heavy, and that's an advantage with the doors, because as you're moving your pieces around the board, you would otherwise be knocking these things over all the time. But because they're metal, they stand upright, and they don't tip over quite so easily. Here we have more cards, and once again, there's evidence of that warping taking place. It doesn't matter quite so much with these cards because they're not secret. There's nothing to be given away. These are simply the weapon cards that your characters will use as they move around the board. Here we have the next set of cards. These are the equipment cards that your characters will be taking into the bunker with them. They're not warped, and I don't know why. I made them in exactly the same way. Perhaps I didn't stand them in the sun or kept them away from a heater or something. I really can't tell, but these ones came out quite flat. Here is one of the major features of the game, the clock. The game is played against this clock, and there are two dials that you can see here, and you turn these around to tick the clock down from 60 minutes down to nil, where the game will end. This is printed onto medium weight card and folded over to give me two sides. I then used a split pin which I pushed through a hole in the middle and bent out on the opposite side, and that allows these two dials to spin quite freely. On the back of this clock is a flap that you bend out and it holds the clock in an upright position. This is very similar to what you might find on the back of a picture frame. Unfortunately for me, I printed my clock out on a card that was slightly too thin for this flat to work, so I ended up having to glue extra support, extra thicker card onto that in order to make it strong enough to hold the clock upright. The thin card I used allowed it to stand upright, but as soon as you touched it, it would fall over. So, again, I recommend you use a thick card, or you strengthen it as I've done, with additional card being stuck onto it. And here are all the boards complete, nine of them plus that entrance way. And finally, here you can see one page taken from the rule book. It's full of lovely photos and lots of examples of play. One regret I have about printing this out is that I went cheap and printed it in black and white. The game deserves a nice colour manual, and that's what I wish I'd printed out. There you go, that's just a quick run through of the components. This video has been produced for the Print and Play podcast. You can find that on the web at printandplay.co.uk and you can find the game at warmaker.com.